Oh, hello. Preacher Bob here. Just trying to text a message to my wife on my phone. You know, being able to send text messages on telephone is a remarkable technology. But to go along with that technology, you also need something else. You need kind of an autocorrect, and, and our phones have that autocorrect feature. If you have Mickey Mouse hands like I've got, then it goes behind you, cleans up, and all those cases where your pudgy little fingers just weren't able to hit those tiny little keys with any kind of precision. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians talks about something very similar. He talks about how the Holy Spirit works in the life of the believer. And for all the world, it sounds like an autocorrect at work. Want to see how that works? Come with me as we go into Extreme Church. Let us pray. Holy God, one of Jesus' final earthly acts before he ascended to be with you was to open the minds of his disciples so that they could understand the scriptures. He wanted them to know how his life and ministry had fulfilled everything that was written. We, too, desire to understand your word to us. We want to know the meaning of your life and death to our daily experiences. We ask for wisdom and understanding as the text is read and proclaimed. So speak to us the message of life, hope, faith. Instruct us in the way that you would have us go. In Jesus' name, amen. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. That's why when I heard of the solid trust that you have in Master Jesus and your outpouring of love to all the Christians, I just couldn't stop thanking God for you every time I pray. I think of you and I give thanks. But I do more than thank. I ask. Ask that the God of our Master Jesus Christ, the God of glory, make you intelligent and discerning and knowing him personally your eyes focused and clear so that you can see exactly what it is he's calling you to do. Grasp the immensity of this glorious way of life that he has for Christians. Oh, the utter extravagance of his work in us who trust him. Endless energy, boundless strength. All this energy issues from Christ. God raised him from the dead and set him on a throne in deep heaven in charge of running the universe, everything from galaxies to governments, no name and no power exempt from his rule. And not just for the time being either, but forever. He's in charge of it all. He's got the final word on everything. At the center of all this, Christ rules the church. The church, you see, is not peripheral to the world the world is peripheral to the church. The church is Christ's body in which he speaks and acts, by which he fills everything with his presence. If you have a cell phone, which I'm assuming probably most of you do, it comes with a built-in feature called autocorrect. Now, Autocorrect is 
sort of an automatic data validation function, the purpose of which is to correct some of the most common and egregious spelling and typing errors, uh, thereby saving time for the one who uses it. In essence, it attempts, and the, op the, the operative word here is attempts, to interpret the text that you're typing and insert the word or the phrase that it thinks that you are about to type. Think of it as having sort of a virtual spouse or significant other uh, in your mobile device telling you what you are about to think or say. Now, as useful as technology like this can be, it can cause problems, often with both hilarious and or disastrous results, thus proving the Preacher Bob theorem. For every leap in technology designed to increase productivity and save time, there is also an exponential leap in the ways in which that technology can go horribly awry and negate its original purpose. Now, here are a couple examples I'll share with you this morning. A girl by the name of Emily texts to her boyfriend, uh, says, love you, babe, good night. Robert, the boyfriend, texts back. He says, my love for you is strong. I would buy you a casket if I could. And then he texts again. He says, castle, I promise I meant castle. Autocorrect, why do you ruin me so? Emily? Hello? Another example is someone texts, I'm fighting with Mike. On the other end, it's texted back again. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. Yeah, it's bad. And I think it's that this is it this time. He just drove off with his mother's corpse. With her corpse? No, no, her Camaro. And then the recipient texts back, you know, you're beginning to scare me. <laughs> See, these messages, and a lot of which you can, if you're really interested in this, the internet is full of these messages. And, and when I was researching this sermon, I found a whole lot of them, but I got to be honest, I couldn't share hardly any of them with you uh, this morning because we are in a church environment and they just, they just wouldn't be appropriate. But they're really funny and you can look them up if you want to. But these messages go awry because of this, uh, this autocorrect feature that we have on our, on our phone. And as these examples, and I'm sure your own personal experience show, the result is sometimes not what we expect it to be. But unintended, funny, and even outright embarrassing messages aside, the main story about autocorrect is how well it works most of the time. It's really not an exaggeration to call autocorrect the most overlooked underwriter of our time. Without it, we wouldn't be able to compose windy love letters from stadium bleachers or write novels on subway commutes or dash off a breakup text to your, uh, to your significant other while you're standing in line at the post office. Without it, our phones probably wouldn't look anything like what they do. The whole notion of a touch screen and typing where our, where our pudgy little fingers are supposed to land with precise precision on tiny virtual keys, it's only viable when you've got some pretty serious software to come around and tidy up after you. So, autocorrect really is a good thing. We might rage against it from time to time, but by and large, the technology makes tapping out messages easy and, well, for the most part, readable. And yet, while autocorrect is definitely a creation of our own time, it might just be that the Apostle Paul had something similar in mind when he wrote to the Ephesians. And from the RSV, we have it this way. He says, I pray that God may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart in light, you may know what is the hope to which we have been called, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe. 
Now, although that term, spirit of wisdom, is used here without being preceded by the word holy, Paul is almost certainly talking about God's spirit. The Holy Spirit. Paul is talking about the Holy Spirit of God. And notice what Paul says that divine spirit can do. It can help us to know what is the hope to which we are called. To know the richness of the inheritance we have as believers. To know the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe. Now, those are that's pretty lofty language. But if we unpack them, if we shorthand them, they're telling us that the Holy Spirit gives us that ability to view things through eyes that have been made clear by our faith in God. Now that's easy enough to say, but that doesn't always happen at first. You see, sometimes the Spirit has to auto-correct our vision so that we understand additional meaning in those things that we're seeing. Now let's, let's leave Ephesians aside for a while. Let's just kind of set it on the table. And let's go into the Psalms. One place where it's very easy for us to see evidence of that holy autocorrect at work is in the Psalms, particularly those Psalms that we refer to as laments or complaints. Psalm 13, for example. The psalmist begins that Psalm by Asking God how long God is going to leave him hanging in his troubles. How long, O oh Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? And then the psalmist goes on for about three or four verses stating all his complaints and pleading for help. Then all of a sudden, Right there in the very last verse, he says, I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Zing. See, there's your autocorrect at work. Or you have Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me, from the words of my groaning? And then the psalmist says, posterity will serve in future generations. We'll be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying, he has done it. Another autocorrect. Or, if you want to see autocorrect at work in a single verse, look at Psalm 42, 11. Why are you cast down on my soul and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my help and my God. Now, a cynic might look at these psalms and say, well, you know, those complaints are, are, are real enough. But the psalmist is just throwing in those affirmations of faith at the end just as sort of like insurance so that he doesn't tick God off. Maybe so. It's more likely, however, that airing his complaints before God enables him to see a bigger picture in which faith is intersected by what we are experiencing. I am very often have folks in my office who come and, and for one reason or another, they have some gripe or complaint against God and uh, they, for some reason, they come to the preacher to, to express that. And I go, you know, you're really talking to the wrong person. You know, if you've got a complaint against God, don't talk to me, talk to God. And it's like they're horrified because that's just, we're raised to believe that that's just something we're not supposed to do. But I got a little news flash for you, boys and girls. You know, if you've got doubts, if you've got a complaint against God, if you're mad about, at God about something, it's not like he doesn't already know. You know what I'm saying? So just be honest. And when we are honest with God, when we express these, as, these complaints as the psalmist does, we find that that holy autocorrect kind of guides us to that place where our complaints and faith intersect. 
God reminds the psalmist of a bigger picture. This abrupt transition, for instance, we see in Psalm 13 from complaint to praise doesn't mean that the gratitude that the psalmist feels eliminates the grievance that he had in the first place. Rather, it means that the seeming contradiction and conflict that he experienced is a stark picture of the contradiction and conflicts that we face every day as we try to live the life of faith. It's kind of a common man thing. There are times, brothers and sisters, when the life of faith does seem to be very ambiguous and complex. The spiritual conflict that we experience on a daily basis, it is real. It is palpable. All of us can identify with that. We've all had those times. There are times when it really seems like the promises of God are, 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 are far from being realized. Times when God just doesn't seem to be there. Times when we doubt. Times when we are afraid. Times when we are overwhelmed by darkness and despair and our own inhumanity. And then it's that holy autocorrect that comes to play. See, that holy autocorrect on our phones is different from the, the holy autocorrect. The, on our phones, it serves as a replacement for, whereas the holy autocorrect that the Apostle Paul was talking about doesn't wipe out the experience. It doesn't make it go away. Instead, it adds a new dimension, another view, which in the long run is capable of sustaining us. Now, whether you want to admit it or not, we live with contradictions in the life of faith. When I was coming in this morning from Greensboro, was listening to the radio, and a priest was talking about some, some statistics that he had just recently come across. And the statistics showed 97, that uh, 93% of, of those who were polled in the United States believe in God. Only 3% were atheists who said they did not believe in God, and 4% were, um, were agnostics who said they didn't know whether God existed or not. But 93% of people believe in God. But it's that 3 and that 4% you see that we come in contact with from day, uh, on a daily basis. And when we come in contact with these people who do not believe, the biggest gotcha, the biggest gotcha that they have is that contradiction that we have to face every single day in the life of faith. It is a reality that we crash into on a daily basis. I mean, let's be honest, folks. When you turn on the news, when you look at the newspaper, doesn't it really seem like the, the, the world is, is, is running along, nobody's in charge, ain't nobody at the switch, you know? And yet as Christians, we proclaim that the earth is the Lord and all that's in it. We affirm that the Lord is merciful and yet at the same time complain that it seems like there are some folks that just get away with murder. Haven't we all asked the question, where was God when all those Christians in Egypt were being beheaded by ISIS on the beach? If we're honest with ourselves, we'll confess that all of us have at one time or another cursed and praised God with equal sincerity within the same day. So what's the takeaway with all this? Well, the takeaway is that we need not be derailed by this clash between the pain and contradiction that we experience on earth and the hope of God's kingdom. For a lot of us... It's really unrealistic to expect that our faith is going to always be unsinkable and always overriding the evidence of the chaos of this world that we see right before our very eyes. But neither is it correct to assume that what we see with our eyes is all that there is. You see, those are the times that we need to look to our hearts. 
that we wait on God's holy autocorrect, that spirit of revelation and wisdom in our text to help us see beyond what is in front of us and point us once again to God's presence that underlies all of our lives. Job, when he was going through his most intense times of suffering, said, though God slay me, I will still find hope in him. Now recall that in the midst of his suffering, Job protested to God over and over again that his his suffering was undeserved, and it was. He His suffering was the result of a bet that God lost with a confrontation with the devil. Job wound up sort of the odd man out, and he suffered greatly. His body was afflicted with disease, his wealth was taken away, his, his children were, were taken away from him. The only, thing, the only thing that Satan left him was a wife that just wouldn't shut up. But I digress. What Job expressed was real, was honest. Now, I have folks that come to me all the time, and they use the phrase, well, you know, oh, he's got the patience of Job. I go, have, have you read Job? Job was, Job was not a happy puppy. He was angry. He was upset, and rightfully so, because he didn't deserve what he got. Job's complaints about God's apparent unwillingness to intervene is angry and it's sharp. It's real. They were words that were spoken out of a position of faith, but in an environment of chaos. You see, Job's faith in justice is not broken down, and God and Job's belief in God is unwavering, but he's no longer able to see a connection between God and and justice. He believes in justice in spite of believing in God, and he believes in God in spite of believing in justice. But we see through the book of Job that holy autocorrect at work, sustaining Job in this affirmation that somehow, somewhere, through mechanisms he cannot see, he cannot understand, maybe can't even fathom that faith and justice in God are going to be united again. One of my favorite stories from the Old Testament was is about Elijah. Now, a little background here. I don't know if you've read the story or not. Elijah was a very powerful prophet. He was ordered by God to command that it not rain for, for, three, for three years as a result of the sin of Ahab and Jezebel, and he said the word, and it didn't, not one drop. They, the Bible, Scripture tells us there wasn't even dew on the ground. Now, that's dry. And so Elijah performed these mighty miracles in God. He, he raised the uh, son, the dead son of the widow of Zarephath. He uh, made her food supply multiply, over and over again so that she wouldn't go hungry through the famine. When Elijah finally contested with the 400 Baal prophets on Mount Carmel, he said a word, a single prayer, and fire fell from heaven and consumed a water-soaked offering to the Lord, and then he proceeded to kill all 400 prophets of Baal. It was a busy day for Elijah. And so this man who uh, had performed so many miracles caught the attention of Jezebel. And Jezebel put a contract out on his life, said, if I see him, I'm going to kill him. And this man of God at whose hand these tremendous miracles had been worked ran screaming and hollering like a little girl out into the desert. Found himself cave, and if he'd been able to, he'd have pulled the entrance in on him and Inside that cave, he started doing what a lot of us do. He started complaining, oh, Lord, you know, I have worked so hard for you, and I have done everything for you, and, you know, I have, I, I did everything that you asked me to do, and nobody loves me, and nobody wants me, and I'm the only one left. Speaking of 
Spirit of God came to Elijah and said, just step to the edge, to the mouth of the cave. And when Elijah did that, he saw this mighty holocaust of fire sweep across the face of the mountain. Scripture tells us God was not in the fire. A horrible wind swept across the mountain so powerful that it even moved the rocks. And the scripture says that God was not in the wind. But as Elijah stood there, the Spirit of God came to him in that still, small voice. And it said, Elijah, what are you doing here? was the holy autocorrect at work. Well, I just said, well, you know, Lord, I, I just have tried to do everything you asked me to do, and, you know, and it just ain't, has never done anything but cause me trouble, and, and, and I'm the only one left. And God says, look, dude, you know, you're not the only one left. I, I got 7,000 people who haven't bowed a knee to Baal that you don't even know about. And then he gave Elijah a job to do. So the Holy Autocorrect gives us eyes to be able to see beyond our fears, to be able to see beyond our doubts, to give us faith that somehow God is going to make it right for us. Boys and girls, this world in which we live, in which we live out this life of faith, is one that is chaotic. There's injustice all around, violence is rampant, hunt, there's hunger, there's pain, there's illness. These are stark realities, friends, that just simply will not go away. And all of those sometimes make it hard for us and for other people to believe in God. Every one of us who are here this morning have experienced our times like Job and Elijah, Times when it would be very easy for us to all retreat to our own personal spiritual caves to nurse our, our perceived hurts and pout that, some, that God didn't intervene or God didn't show himself or God didn't do things the way that we thought he ought to do them. But if we, like Elijah, would just step to the mouth of the cave and listen for God, that holy autocorrect will give us eyes to see a whole lot bigger picture. To see where God is working where we can't see. And if you're real lucky, he might just give you something to do. Let us pray. Use us, Lord, for whatever purposes and in whatever ways that you may require. We give you our hearts as empty vessels. Fill them with your grace. We give you our sinful and troubled souls. Quicken and refresh them with your love. Take our heart for your home, our mouths to spread the glory of your name, our love and all of our powers for the advancement of your people and never allow the steadfastness and confidence of our faith to grow slack. For Christ's sake and in his name we pray. Amen.